I'm, I'm good. I actually had the privilege of seeing that um, at Cannes. And actually, the first name oh, wow. after uh, is Taylor Shung, who is a friend of mine. And I, and I like texted her, because I had no idea that she had oh, been. Wow. Yeah, I had no idea that Taylor had worked on this yeah. film, because I guess it, it uh, you shot before the pandemic, if that's I remember right. yeah, correctly. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then, and then I, and then I was really excited. So I feel a, a very deep con sense of connection uh, to the film because Taylor worked on it, and then um, have seen it. It's also at, at Sundance, so I feel like you know, just <laughs> sort of me and this film yeah, together yeah. have um, ha you know had a had a journey, not as much as obviously you have had, but um, I guess to start this, the origin of the movie is from a short story called um, Saying Goodbye to Yang. Yeah. Though, though actually, I think in the newest book, it's actually renamed after Yang, sort of after um, the movie. But it's different. I mean, it is sort of a jumping off point. Um, but there is so much more backstory. And you know, there's a new level of interiority for Yang as a character. And so I'm kind of curious how the story became this movie, and like where, where you joined with it, because I think Teresa Park also optioned it yeah. originally. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so tell you know, I'm very personally okay. curious about how this yeah, came to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, uh, a shout out to Taylor because yeah. she's great, and thank you guys for having <laughs> me, and thanks for coming out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Appreciate that so much, and uh, and I like your necklace as well, which Thank is super you. cool. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it it was this short story in this collection, and um, yeah, and Tr uh, Teresa had um, had gotten the rights to another short story in that collection, and she had uh, that's the the short that I had initially read, and then. I didn't think it was the film I wanted to make next, yeah. but she had encouraged me to read the other short stories, and then I had read this one, which was the very first story, and yeah, it was pretty spare. You know, in the, the short story itself takes place in a day, and uh, it's really through the father kind of recollecting some memories of Yang. You know, it's not about Yang's memories, or you know, and <laughs> it's in that day that he has some deeper appreciation for Yang and. Maybe even a realization that he's actually grieving over the loss of Yang, and that takes place over you know the course of a day. So yeah, I had a lot of room for me to really kind of explore what, what felt very interesting to me. Um, yeah, and and Weinstein was real generous. He when he knew that I was going to adapt it, he said, "Make it your own." You know, so yeah. And then in terms of making it your own. Why did you choose the themes that you you did? I mean, so it was something that I actually find really, what you know, it, it was fun to hear the the laughter and the line. Um, you know, he he didn't necessarily wonder about whether or not he was human. You know, which is, yeah, yeah. but he did wonder if he was Chinese. Yeah. And 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 so I'm kind of curious, yeah. uh, what you were what you were trying to say there or explore, and you know, especially as. Um, Chinese American, you're Korean American. This is kind of idea of kind of you know having a liminal existence between you know our you know our how Asian or how American we are. Yeah, I mean there are so many things that interested me about it, and um, uh, so it's hard to to name just one. But I will talk about the Asian part of it. You know, Alexander Weinstein is not Asian, but he had written this sort of Asian robot. And you know what was immediately uh, interesting and curious to me was that um, being an Asian robot doesn't necessarily make you Asian, right? That it's some construct of Asianness, <laughs> and uh, and there was something that I could almost deeply relate to about being a construct of Asianness. You know, I think for anyone who's part of the uh, diaspora. Um, a bunch of our identity is really um, a construction. You know, we have to make our identity based on um, the perception, our own perception of what it means to be Asian. You know, separated from a homeland and a culture, uh, everyone else's perception of what it means to be Asian. And I think we're constantly negotiating that, um, and maybe sometimes feeling like we fall short of our Asianness. You know, I think I often feel that, um, or maybe at times feeling too Asian. You know, so there was some question about uh, Yang's sense of being not necessarily human. I thought he felt sort of settled with 
you know, his being, but, um, but he had this one purpose, which was to pass along Asian-ness and his own longing for his own sense of place and memory and that. The, that was definitely something that I was really uh, wanted to dig into. And you call it, a, is it a techno, a, a cultural a, techno? Yeah, d yeah, he was a cultural techno and they call him techno sapiens, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And then Maya, I know in terms of um, cultural technos, in terms, you know, if this idea of having culturally specific robots, I mean, what's your take kind of on that as a, as, as something that, you know, whether or not something we should aspire to, you know, it, or maybe not? Well, as it happens, we were just exploring this in my lab. Uh, I have a graduate student who was compelled by the fact that there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you have culturally matched educators or doctors, then, you know, people relate to them better and they do better, students do better, et cetera. But it's very hard to get that in certain under-resourced communities, right? So she was very motivated. She said, oh, I want to create, you know, robot teachers that would relate to the students because they're from their culture. And the more we talked about it, the more I realized how incredibly fraught this would be. For example, she said, I want to create something for the really poor, um, maybe black and, and uh, Hispanic neighborhoods. And I said, well, if you're not black or Hispanic, this would be completely not OK, right? <laughs> People would not accept it, yeah. even though it comes from a right place. But I was also thinking, as a parent, you know, how do you make the decision, who is the right person to bring up your child? Yeah. I mean, look at the parents. They all come from different cultures, potentially. Yeah. And so who is to say, you know, what is the right culture? Do we want our children to experience everything so that they can deal with everything? I mean, it's, so, it's just yeah. so complex. But it's really happening right now in my lab. And I feel, I feel torn, because on the one hand, I want to empower my student to explore this. But on the other hand, I feel like she will just get bombarded by criticism if she goes down that way. Mm -hmm. Because think about it, also if you create a machine that is culturally specific, it's yeah. like you're profiling. Right, right, so. right. Well, I mean, that, you know, it's like someone has to, if, if Yang is like manufactured sense of Asianness, right? Someone's making that decision of what Asianness is. And Fun facts. It, yeah, right? and <laughs> right. one of the questions right. that I had is like, oh, are they building it to make the, these families feel comfortable? So there's this version of Asianness that might be comfortable for Caucasian families or other families, right? So you know that no, you know, Asianness itself can't be reduced to anything, right? There, and one of the things when you're constructing your own identity is you realize, oh, there's a spectrum, you know, and, and Asians sometimes are often comparing themselves and feeling like they fall short or, or they feel inadequate. But yeah, I think it's like the diverse, even within a culture, there's so much diversity. So if you're trying to define it, yeah, you are also uh, eliminating a lot of things that you're saying is not a part of that culture, right? Just by, yeah, yeah. And then in terms of uh, how close are we to this. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not close. Yeah. Not close. Not, I wish, or maybe I wish, I don't know. Uh, but we're, no, 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 we are not close at all. Although, certainly something, for example, the idea of um, knowing a lot about a culture. Yeah. We can do that today, but mm -hmm. it will not be embodied in this, you know, wonderful, thoughtful, ultimately emotional, yeah. um, artificial creature. We don't have any idea how to do that. Um, we can create now robots that look realistic, that are, um, if you don't dig into a deep interaction with them, they could be quite engaging, they could be interesting, but it's very narrow, it's very focused. The amazing thing about Yang is that, you know, he goes from situation to situation smoothly. The part that I found incredibly compelling was his conversation with the father about the tea. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way, you know, don't worry, that's not coming anytime <laughs> soon. Yeah. We would have no idea how to do that. Yeah. You know, fun facts, we can do that today. Yeah. Uh, a deep conversation about the meaning of tea and life's purpose, no. <laughs> Although, I, you know what I'll say is that what, one of my interests, and I think we're already here, and uh, it was not so much about um, Yang uh, as much as our, the hum, humans having to deal with their emotional attachment to technologies, you know, or the way in which um, technology has really, uh, so that, you know, like suddenly you're looking at your phone and uh, the phone has 
put a slideshow of your your family, you know, and all of a sudden you're you know they've added music, and this device <laughs> is is creating kind of a yang like experience uh, as well. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask is um, beyond you know when we think of artificial intelligence and that question versus just artificial presence, you know, the the fact that there are things that are you know, like I, I know people who get sad when they, their car dies and, and they have to give that up, right? Or, and that we as human beings tend to have a lot of emotional attachments, whether it's our pet or vehicles, and the more complex um, technology becomes, not in this sort of human yang figure, but just in the way that, you know, tech can, does represent time and being in some ways, you know, just the, the presence. And I thought it was interesting because when I initially read the story, it wasn't so much like, oh, this robot that feels so human, but even if it's an appliance, you know, and I remember talking to Alexander about it, is like, you know, initially they feel like their vacuum cleaner has broken, you know, has, you know and, they, and, and then as a kind of deeper uh, sense of that appliance, kind of makes them feel like they have a, a sort of grief that they have to contend with. So there's, some, you know, it's interesting in, in, for me in the fact that uh, there is some kind of deeper emotional attachments that we, we might be having with, with things that we might define as artificial. Yeah. Well, if I could riff on that, actually, yeah. it's, it's really interesting that you use the term vacuum cleaner because, as I'm sure people are familiar, for, I don't know, 15, 20 years now, we've had these Roomba vacuum cleaners, the little round thing that runs around, bumps into things, and cleans your floor very slowly. Um, so people have been buying these for a long time. They're quite successful. Most people get really attached to their Roomba. So there have been studies now, actual scientific arm's length studies that have been done. And when people's Roombas break, I mean, it's a $200 thing. Well, OK, it's more than that now. But you know, the bottom level model is like 250 um, when it breaks, the company just wants to send you a new one. It's not worth it to them to fix it. But people don't want it. They etch their name in it. They say, no, I want mine. It knows me. Yeah. So people really, and I'm not talking about the fringe population. I'm talking about most users who really, you know, the way we say, oh, you know, dog, my dog can do these amazing things that it really can't. But, you know, we, we think we really truly believe that, you know, our dog is special. People believe their rooms are special. Their Roombas are special to them. Yeah. And so this is already happening precisely with vacuum cleaners. Yeah, that's amazing. So can you imagine how much we, we would project on something yeah. that's humanoid? Yeah. Um, because that's how we're wired. We're wired to interpret anything that's lifelike as being intentional, emotional, yeah. goal-driven, right? Yeah. And so I think if a machine even, in some sense, conveys a sense of inner life, yeah. the way that Yang certainly does. Sure, yeah. And can you imagine what we would build <laughs> yeah. around it? And we would want to know more, and we wouldn't want to let it go. Yeah. No, and I think that that, like, the ability to feel loss, and obviously, I, I was saying that, you know, if the story I'd read was about an, uh, a son dying, you know, right at the beginning of the story, uh, and I love, you know, James Agee wrote A Death in the Family, and it was this, I've loved that novel forever, and when I read this, I was like, oh, this is a version of this, but it has enough distance that it, like we all understand immediate loss. We were just talking about uh, that, you know, before, like, and, but there was something peculiar, I think, of human beings dealing with other forms of loss that are like little deaths, that are a foreshadowing of this, this death that we all know is coming. Um, and those kind of stories have always really interested me and, and, and fascinate me. And, and um, yeah, so you're right. Like it, it could be a Roomba, and as you know, that gets more complex, we're going to feel a you know more severe kind of forms of loss. And I like you know, for me, it's also like how does I think Yang. I think Jake thinks he's going to fix Yang, and through the process, right, Yang is sort of fixing him, like a human. Like this tech is ultimately as he kind of gets deeper into this sort of world and feels these sort of temporalities that, that Yang is sort of revealing, um, you know, it's really this human that's getting sort of like reattuned to, to life and being. And I think that's really interesting because I think, you know, we are living in an age where tech is so much about 
capturing time, you know, and, um, you know, in Asian culture, you know, like uh, the cherry blossoms have always been really symbolic of kind of revealing to us human beings about the transience, of, you know, of, of, of life and, and that it's valuable for that um, ability. But I think, you know, um, our phones and all kinds of tech is constantly revealing temporalities of being, you know, we, we, if we attend to it in that way, yeah. And so, as you say, um, in the end, we realize that it's Yang who's really sort of serving or helping um, Jake. And in terms of where, we, where are we right now with robots helping humans? Like, are we, we know we're very, very far away from this, but like, what, what can they do at this point? So let me first draw the distinction between what they can do in the lab and what they can do you know, in like in, in the in wild. Commerc yeah. commercial space. So you can't buy these things yet, but for example, in, in you know, quite a few labs now, uh, we have demonstrated robots that can, for example, work with children with autism to help teach them social skills, mm -hmm. um, work with Alzheimer's patients to make them feel less lonely and engaged in something. Like in one six month study, we actually got Alzheimer's patients to get better at recognizing songs and they felt better and they would say things like, oh, I can't wait for my buddy to come visit me. I don't want to go for a walk or I don't want to miss it. They would weave entire narratives around it in their own worlds, which are very different from maybe the world that we perceive, but it really became a part of their lives. Um, so there are quite a lot of therapeutic, well-intentioned kind of systems being developed, but they're not quite out in the real world yet because as you can imagine, it's complex. There's some issues of, you know, liability, not the same way as with autonomous cars, for example, right? Like they're, you know, oh, you know, trolley problem, all of that. Um, with this stuff, it's, it's not that. It really is issues like, well, what if it does work and you, you form an attachment yeah. and then it breaks? Yeah. Um, also, people worry a lot about privacy. You know, I, I just kind of want to laugh at that since we've already given up privacy in every possible <laughs> way. So it's like, so what is the extra thing that this robot will know that your phone doesn't already know? I, I just want to know. People always ask me this, like, what about privacy? And I want to say, what about it? You know, are you on Facebook? Because forget it. But, but these are, you know, people don't worry about it, right? And so, and, and then what people do worry about quite reasonably is that, once you have this companion, and we can build them right now, right? I, I can give you right now a companion that will make your child learn better, your elderly person feel less lonely, um, you know, whoever to exercise more, whatever. I can give you that right now in a very narrow kind of scope of what it can do. But then, you know, who is distributing this? What if they say things like, oh, you're doing great, let's take uh, one more lap in your new Nikes. Or, you know, so you know, you're really, it's kind of, there are all kinds of unintended consequences because of special interests. And that's what people worry about a lot. And so, for better or worse, I mean, it's coming. It's definitely coming. But Yang, Yang unfortunately isn't coming soon enough. Right. And, you know, in the same way that we now have meta, like, is there going to be, like, the robot equivalent of, like, a big meta company selling us, you know, these private, <laughs> privacy invading robots, you know, off, off the shelf. But in terms of creating robots or the ones that are in the lab or maybe almost um, in the wild, do they look realistic? Should they look realistic? Like, should we aspire? I mean, you know, every, you know, Star Trek with Data and obviously Yang, there, there's a sort of narrative that we're trying to create robots that look superhuman, but at the same time, there are also, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the, the dancing animal, like, like metal robots that are super creepy. I mean, in my in my world, and so you know they're definitely kind of going not su not as realistic, but all but but like kind of realistic. It's 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 uh, there there's something like very bothersome about that whole you know the the dancing videos of like the you know the animal um, robots. And I was just wondering like what what is a sort of philosophy of of what form the robot should take from, for, from our human perception? That's a really great question, and that's a really fundamental question that a lot of people who are now designing intelligent machines want to answer. Um, and there is no simple answer. One answer is that if you build a machine that strives to look realistic, then you will likely fall into what we call the uncanny valley, which is that the machine will overpromise in its looks, or perhaps in its voice, or you know, some feature that it has, and then it'll disappoint. So very realistic looking robots um, tend to not move in natural ways because 
just because you look like a human doesn't mean that you move in every possible way like a human. If you build a robot face that has all the muscles that a human face has, that's an incredibly hard thing to control. And so it looks creepy and weird. If you build a simpler face, then you know it's easier to control. It looks, it's like simple animation, right? Simple cartoons can be really believable and really interactive and you know enjoyable. Whereas really complex things, like you know, think of early animation that just looked kind of creepy. It wasn't quite right. So that's the same with robotics, except unlike animation, where you can spend millions of dollars and lots of time to do all the frames just right before you release the film, you can't do that with a robot. It has to be in real time. Everything has to work just so in real time. And that's a lot of, that's just a whole lot of motors, a lot just, you know, think about all this movement that I've got going on right now. Um, and I could do more. Um, that, that takes a lot of motors and batteries and, and you know, artificial muscles and things like that. And so it, there's a lot of cost, there's a lot of weight. The more weight, the more danger, more cost. So we're not really, as a field in robotics, going towards humanoids. There's like a little subfield and it's fun and people are building things, but that's not what we're aiming for. Um, if you look at the robots that are being released now, like for example, Amazon just released well, released. They just announced a robot called Astro. And it's, you know, basically Alexa on wheels. It's a short little thing that has a screen and two wheels, and it will talk through Alexa. And that's kind of where the state of the art is going. Because that's small, that's cheap, it's simple. It can be focused at doing what it needs to do. The humanoid, just getting it to stand up and not fall over. And then there's an entire branch of research that just deals with when it falls over, how does it get up? It's <laughs> not simple, right? Um, and so, so no, that's not the direction that the field is going in. And also think about it, when you have something human-sized that has any strength at all, it's inherently dangerous. Just falling over, it can really hurt someone. So we tend to like to build things that will be safer and cheaper and stay in control. And that is very different from humanoids. And then what can those smaller, safer, cheaper robots do? Like, what are they targeted Yeah, at? so that's, that's a really interesting problem because people tend to think that we want things that will do these, you know, oh, I want to empty my laundry, you know, like I, my, my washing machine and have something, put it in the dryer and then fold it. Okay, that's not coming soon. <laughs> I mean, you can actually build machines that will kind of pre-do that for you, which is smarter than trying to, you know, do it yourself. That's not coming. But what can they do? Well, they can do a lot. They can be very aware of their environments. So, because we're also putting cameras in, in people's environments, right? So you can have a machine that knows a lot about what's going on in your world. It can remind you of things. It can protect you from things that you don't want to have happen because it knows a lot. Um, it can do things like, you know, make sure that something bad doesn't happen to your kid or your elderly person that, that is in your house. But it's all about prevention. If the person has already fallen, getting that person up is beyond the state of the art in robotics. So that's the thing to understand is that robots can be very smart and AI can be very smart in very narrow ways. But these, these things that we can do, walk across the room and open the door for any room and any door, there is no AI or robot that can do that today. Common sense, out of reach. <laughs> simple, narrow tasks. And I'm saying simple, but like chess. Yeah, sure, we can beat the best human in chess. It's a very specific thing, and that chess playing thing will not be able to do anything else but play chess. So this, we talk a lot in AI about human level intelligence. No one has any idea how to go there. So that's just the reality, folks, so that's fine. You know, you hear a lot of hype about AI and it's gonna take a lot of jobs away. To the extent that they're narrow and well-defined, definitely. Like I was just, sorry to keep talking about this, mm -hmm. but just today my heart was broken because one of my students, incredibly smart, um, amazing students. So she sent me a link to this new AI thing that now can do art. Oh, really Dolly. good art, right? Dolly. And or, at first yeah. I thought, oh, how neat. But then five minutes later I thought, you know, I know a lot of artists who can't make a living. I don't want this thing. Why is it making art? Like, you let artists make art. <laughs> you know, and I'm a techie, so I really felt like, oh, what am I doing? But no, I don't like it. Um, so that's the interesting thing that we're straddling. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll speak a little bit um, to to that. So from OpenAI, Dolly, they just came up with the second generation, much faster. Um, so the first generation, I think they maybe announced a year or two ago, the images were 256 by 256 mm -hmm. pixels. Now they're up to 1,000, oh. 1, 
1096, 1096 to 1096. But one of the, um, someone observed that once upon a time we assumed that AI, or AIs would be doing like kind of more mathy things, much more like uh, logical things first, and then it would move up kind of towards creative things. But you know, with open AI, they've done, uh, now they have Dolly, which can just kind of draw. I, I actually used a very early version of it, where it, you can basically tell it what you want it, what you want it to draw, and then it will draw it because it's like seen all the images on the the internet. And I told it I wanted a baby Yoda flying over the horizon of New York City at dusk, and it generated like like. 16 images that were pretty good. I mean, they were more like like old Yoda instead of baby Yoda, because I think most images on the internet are of old Yoda. But it did a pretty good job of having a Yoda fly over New York City at dusk. But it's interesting because it, instead of kind of being you know logical and then progressing to creative between Dolly and also GPT-3, which basically can can write almost. Um, it's, it seems like it's AI starting on the creative side, and then maybe it'll progress sort of in some towards some of the more, more practical things. Well, I just have to say, since I was looking at the art piece yeah. today, it can create. You can give it um, words, yeah. and it'll put it together. So it should be. It's good at being creative. It creates new things from old things that it has seen. What it's terrible at, <laughs> and I encourage you all to look at this, is it's terrible at mimicking any existing human artist. So you know they have the girl with the pearl earring, Vermeer. And then it does a replica of it. It's awful. It is way worse <laughs> than forgers. Forgers can do a fantastic job, but you can't tell. And then they can spin it, and yeah. it looks just like another Vermeer. AI can't do that. It cannot get at that essence of what makes a particular piece of art the essence of that artist. So they've got some fake Clint. It looks terrible. Okay, so I encourage you all to look, and then you can email it's me and tell me if you disagree. But that's, I think, that gets at the heart of it. it doesn't, there's no there there. It can take pictures together and make them look cool, and we will put meaning into it and say, oh, that's cool, Baby Yoda, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't come up with that. And then he cannot get the essence of an actual piece of art. So, you know, we're far. Yeah. We're far. But maybe my standards are high. <laughs> I will say that our uh, music composer, Aska, had a friend at USC who's doing a lot of AI with music. And mm -hmm. she, for the, the soundtrack, she, uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto did the theme and she fed this AI the theme and the AI recomposed it. Like kind of, there's a like, sort of ongoing conversation yeah, yeah. and then Asuka then made modifications. So there some part of that soundtrack is influenced by this sort of conversation, but it took a human composer to kind of, because we listened to all of the music that AI, that AI produced, and some was just awful, right? It was, it was <laughs> dissonant, and, but there were strands of it that were really interesting, and, and, yeah. and she was able to pull that out and kind of, you know, yeah, play with it. I mean, this is like, um, it's been a while now that AI has been used to decide what scripts are more likely to make money than others. <laughs> I mean, this is an appropriate place to talk about it, right? <laughs> so, you know, you can do that. You can feed, you can train a system with a bunch of scripts that made a lot of money, and then it'll kind of look for features which are not really human explicable. <laughs> um, are you going to get a good movie out of that? I doubt it, but it'll pick something Is out. Is that called Netflix? <laughs> Is, that yeah. Is there anyone from Netflix there? Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because actually yester, uh, yesterday, so I teach a, I, I help run a class, I, I, I don't know if I teach it, but I, I run a class at Emory, and the speaker that we had is someone who is a digital humanities guy who did his post postdoc at Berkeley and then went to work for Netflix mm. to, exa to, yeah. to do exactly yeah. that. I mean, like he said, um, Netflix isn't ready to hire 20 people to figure that out, but they are ready to hire like five. And so it was interesting to see him go through um, the some of the things that they've done. So one, you know, one of them was like coding like power dynamics between characters, or like how much agency does a character have, and then teaching the AI to recognize that, and then maybe then you would train it on um, train it, you know, train it on scripts. He was doing it actually not on scripts at that point, but just on like novels and and short stories, so more prose. But like that is coming, and and like you said. Is that called Netflix? <laughs> and why? why? Why is that coming? Why can't we focus on robots that help you know, old people or kids with autism? <laughs> like, do, do we not have enough script writers in the world? <laughs> I just don't get it. And I say this as an AI person. Right? There, there are more important problems AI should be working on. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. 
You should make yeah. movies. <laughs> well, Netflix has incredible data, right? I mean, they know exactly what people are wanting to watch and why, um, or maybe not why. Or that like being that. said, he was, so my friend was um, in the analytics team, the days that Squid Game kind yeah. of came from nowhere. Yeah, they were shocked. That is the surprising thing about art is yeah. that, yeah, everyone always feels like, oh, this is the formula, and it's always broken, you know, by yeah. some innovation. And uh, But I, I'm interested, too, and I was read an article about uh, nursing homes and, like, pets as AI that are just about social capacity, and that feels really promising. And, Absolutely. And, yeah, and I was thinking even, like, when you asked, the, like, what is the best form, the human form, but I think, like, animals or, you know, or even simple, like, there's some already built-in uh, relationship and we, we kind of drawn to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And it depends what you want out of the, the companion, right? Yeah. So for example, for the elderly, the having something like a dog-like animal yeah. is great because yeah. it gives them comfort, it gives them that tactile thing that will make you feel better, it makes them socialize with others, um, but it can't tell you what to do. Right. Sometimes you need a coach to really get you to do the thing that you don't want to do, you know, whatever it is walk more, don't eat that terrible food, whatever. Um, and your pet can't really, that, it's very creepy if your dog suddenly start starts talking, talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and no, you're I'm like, what do you know? You're a dog, be quiet, you know what you eat, right? So, so because we're human and we're preloaded with all of these expectations and biases, if you will, we think of pets as pets and they're, yeah. they have a certain realm. Yeah, yeah. And then we have think of humans as something and coaches and subordinates and superiors. And so you really have to think about what is the role of that robot? Yeah. And it needs to stay within its lane. Otherwise, people find it creepy again. And then for the kids in autism, is it birds? What, or what, what, are the, what, what form um, do the kids interact with in terms of the robot? So the, the really interesting thing about autism is that Basically, I mean, it's a spectrum, so there's so many different symptoms and severities. So there isn't, you know, what people say is once you know one person with autism, you know exactly one person with autism, <laughs> which means you need personalized interaction and treatment. But through practice, people can get better at social skills and, you know, things that make us relate to one another. It's never natural, but it can be trained. But the really sad thing is, how do kids learn how to behave? They learn to behave by interacting with other kids. No, it's not the parents. We have some small role to play at the beginning, but it's mostly interacting with other people. Um, kids need to play with other kids. Bad pandemic. Kids need to play with other kids. Kids with autism don't get to play with other kids because other kids don't want to play with them. Because no, kids are mean, because yeah. they're little us. And so <laughs> that's a really sad thing because human, human intelligence is all about practice. Everything is practice. And so what we can do with these machines is we can provide that practice that's missing in the real world for these kids. And so we can give them a social companion, and it can do things like, you know, it can tell them stories and ask them to talk about it. It can just ask them, how do you feel? How was your day? The amazing thing about people, all of us, not just individuals on the spectrum, is that we really want to talk and be heard. And if something is listening, even if it's a something and not a someone, that actually makes a difference. And we open up and we talk and we feel heard. So it's amazing that the robot doesn't even have to understand that much. But it has to understand enough to not say stupid things like, how was your day? It was awful. Oh, that's good. <laughs> right? So it has to, but, but that, we're past that in the state of the art already. And so now we're developing machines that can actually deliver real therapies, right? So for example, right now my lab is working on cognitive behavior therapy through a robot friend. Not because that's better than a human therapist, but because literally today, it's more than a year to get access to a cognitive behavior therapist. And most college students are seriously depressed or have anxiety or both. And that's not even autism. Then we can overlay autism over that. So when there aren't humans there to help, that's kind of where we can put these machines. But never pretend that it's Yang. <laughs> are they it's really not. Yeah. Do they look? What do they look like, if that makes sense? So usually they're much closer to, not, not so much pets, because again, we don't want them to look like pets, because your pet is not your therapist. Right. You know, when your pet, again, the pet cannot tell you, tell me your feelings. Oh, but do you think maybe there's a more positive way to think about that? That would be very weird from your pet, right? <laughs> so so they, they look lifelike, and, and they look kind of human-like, but we have one that looks like an owl. Why? Because owls evoke being wise, and so it's okay to have an owl that talks, right? But right. you probably wouldn't want a puppy, because, you know, puppies smell their butts, so that's probably not 
the thing you want in your therapist. So we think hard about what they look like. <laughs> and it's really important, right? So we have these robots that are about this big and they're really cute. Again, wrong form factor, it looks too cute. Something that's too cute will not actually push you enough to kind of do things that are uncomfortable for you. So that's the important thing in designing these machines, that they have to look the part and play the part. Could they be Muppet-like? I mean... They can. There's some labs that, Baby Yoda. that have used yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that would be fine um, for certain populations, right? So it's really interesting. I've, I've worked with some... I've talked to some companies that have developed these really modern-looking robots for the elderly, and I think that's completely wrong because the people developing them are in their... 20s and 30s, and they love Apple, so they're building Apple-looking stuff. But that's not what people in their 70s and 80s want. They want warm and fuzzy things. So you really have to understand the audience. It's, and it's hard, because you can't ask people, so what kind of robot do you think you'd want? Right. Well, you don't know. You have no idea. <laughs> so you really have to give people versions of things, like mock-ups, and have them play with it and tell you. And mm -hmm. you have to do this iteratively, and companies don't, because they don't have time or money to do it, or often the sensitivity that it needs to be done. But that's the way we have to go. Design is you know, a big thing, and people are really starting to understand how important design is. I mean, it's, it's an artistic endeavor, but it's also functional. So I can't tell you a simple answer to what they should look like, because <laughs> the answer is it depends, depends. Yeah. right? But I bet a new, you know, my, my youngest is so, uh, such an anime fan, and there's so many like deep anime fans. And you know, in that anime world, there are little creatures and slimes, and <laughs> he's gotten so, you know, he fantasizes of having, you know, that kind of like relationship. Um, and, you know, uh, his friend world, you know, there's people just love this kind of alt world. Um, so I wonder if a new generation would, would be really open to, you know, something like that. And, and the great thing about that, now that you bring it up, actually, the great thing about that is, remember I mentioned the uncanny valley? When you see something human-like, you have a lot of expectations of it behaving in human-like ways. But when you have something that's anime, you have totally different expectations, which is easier from a robotics technology perspective, right? Because I don't have to meet your expectations of what a human can do. Yeah. That's a really high bar. Yeah. Which is true. I think we're going to, I think we're supposed to open up to questions, but I, I had one quick question for you, which is um, when you were told that you could make it your own, you're a Korean American, and I think the lead actor, Justin, mm -hmm. is, Justin Min is also Korean American. Mm -hmm. Did you think about shifting it to the adoptee and the the cultural techno was more Korean-centric, or why leave it in, like, China? I don't know if it has, you know, something to do with global politics or sort of the direction of the world, or, you know, uh, and I think the the story has more, the, the original short story has a little bit more backstory about yeah. how how it came to be that they adopted a child from China, but I think you left it yeah. ambiguous here. Yeah, I mean, I think in part because I think the question of Yang being Chinese was was, like, suspect to me like I, I wanted to know what that even meant if he's a robot you know and also because you know I think as an Asian director uh, and a Korean director and there's certain certain things I struggle with that is very specific to my Koreanness but um, again part of the diaspora I think there's a lot to be said about this sort of Pan-Asian experience as well. And also, I feel like, you know, uh, I, I feel like Asian, you know, I have plenty of friends who are Asian actors, and this idea that they can only play one, whereas <laughs> Caucasians can play all kinds of Europeans, and Eng Br British can play American, the idea that, no, if you're Korean, you can only play Korean, you know, feels, uh, yeah, feels like uh, unfair for, for, for an, an actor, you know. Um, are there questions? From the, it's actually really tricky because I the light comes this way and then you guys are all really dark. Just jump up. Yeah, I, I see someone. Yeah, in the middle call. Right yeah, there. feel yeah, free yeah. calling. Go ahead, you. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things is about otherness. You know, I think there's a real history of um, of that in our in human civilization that we're just always, uh, you know, in order to feel inclusive, you know, we will exclude a group, right? And and that always changes. I mean, throughout the generations, we find it something else that can be other. So I was very curious about other beings that are in our world, whether they're clones or uh, uh, technos, and the way in which we have to, you know, what brings dignity to that, that other group? And, and what is it that we 
begin to see or value that will allow us to think in more complex ways about them and, and maybe create even some empathy. So there was just even that simple question of um, the other and the way in which that might migrate into uh, artificial beings, you know. So this is so great. This is what's so great about this whole event because the, like, the words that you use are exactly the words mm. that I would use in my answer as well, having yeah. to do with empathy and otherness. And so if I just may add to that, um, there are already a lot of examples of robots being bullied by people. Oh. So, yeah, I don't, so how could that? <laughs> um, but there is this robot Pepper um, by SoftBank, which is kind of three quarter size. and how we treat one another, right? What I was saying about kids with autism, yeah. or the Asian community, or you know, I'm also an immigrant, so yeah. let me tell you, yeah, 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 we, yeah, we can be wonderful or not. Yeah, I mean, that was like, you know, often the AI in cinema is really the Pinocchio story. It's like, oh, they want to be human, and you know that, and I did like these other questions about human empathy and the, our relationship to them was, again, like something that felt more interesting to me um, as an AI story as opposed to us. You know, it's, it is, feels very human-centric that, oh, whenever we talk about AI, it's just going to be like their fantasy of being human. But I, okay. I think what's really interesting is when we put human beings and we kind of explore the way we both have um, emotional attachment or detachment and, and the way it reveals very human things about us, as you said, like a mirror. That was wonderful, actually. We should see that in more movies, yeah. uh, this idea that, you know, why, why, do they want, why would they want to be human? Yeah. Because yeah. this is what I, always, I also get asked. <laughs> You know, are they gonna gang up on us and kill us all? It's like, why would they do that? Why would they? Just because we do things like that right. doesn't mean that they want to do things like that. Right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I see a hand in that direction. I think it's, is it Graham? Okay, go Graham. So we knew that we were gonna do this sort of low sci-fi and speculative fiction. And I, uh, you know, it was a real conversation that I had with my uh, cinematographer um, in regard to allowing uh, the forms of cinema to be our special effect. So, you know, we didn't show floating monitors uh, or all this sort of uh, kind of high tech world, you know, instead of, um, you know, so that when we had video calls, we just changed the aspect ratio. Those were really Ozu. I wrote in the script like, oh, this, you know, Ozu has his characters look very close, you know, close to the lens and, and he uses this academy ratio. And, and then when we were going to be in human memory and there was going to be this sort of echo and repetition and this way in which um, they, the humans are almost auditioning what what they remember, you know. So there's this feeling of different takes and them trying to get closer to to this subjective moment. Because I don't know if they're trying to get closer to objective reality, but how they're feeling about Yang. And so you sometimes feel him feeling sad because they're feeling sad. And uh, and so I just again wanted to use the form and language of cinema to capture that. And then when we were in Yang's memory, you know, we changed the lens. And so. Uh, so you're right. I think in general reality, there was a kind of static form that was closer to, to my own sensibilities. But this film in particular gave opportunity for me to explore other forms as it related to other uh, 
realms of reality, uh, kinds of memories in many ways. So yeah, I, was, I, I won't name the poet, but I was speaking to this incredible poet in New York, and he had this uh, Asian poet, and he had this it, it take on this film, which was so profound. He's like, oh, I, I've not seen a film that answers the question of what it means to be Asian. And so specifically, and I said, well, what, what, what was the answer to that? You know, out of curiosity. <laughs> and he said, um, to, uh, to be worked to death. You know? <laughs> to really, to be put in service to, to the point of, of, of dying. You know, he was very serious about it. And I was like, that was, you know, incredibly profound, you know, and, and he believed it, and, you know, uh, and, and again, and we also were talking about the death of the author, and I was like, yeah, you know, like, that was, but I think that with that said, I, you know, there's some, some truth there, you know, I think what you're saying is right, and I, um, uh, and as an Asian, uh, kind of seeing the way in which Orientalism and the history of, of labor, you know, yeah, that was certainly in my mind, you know, and, and I was there's a little play of that because um, instead of kind of creating a film that's just trying to defy Orientalism, I think, oh, I have to deal with, you know, this corporation building an Asian for something that they feel like is very, you know, important and useful, and it is in this family. But there's also elements of the, you know, the haircut and the perception and all of that, that is a, a part of it. But also, yeah, I think, you know, in our film, you know, when he, she goes to the beta house, um, there's an Asian girl who, you know, another techno who answers that. And we did have a bit of a code there, you know, and it's, um, it's underneath the surface. And so if you're careful and you can kind of read into to those um, layers of the film, I think, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. If there is a question, I hear, I see like, I see like deep enthusiasm of hair, hand yeah. raising up there. Yeah. Yeah. From a purely manufacturing perspective, yeah. if Yang was assembled in China with Chinese material, is he Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> um, because he's made in China. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was young, I used to tell people I was made in Korea uh, yeah, yeah. for that. Um, no, that. I mean, I think, you know, it is like the, like I think it fundamentally, when we talk about identity, um, I think it's complex, right? I don't know. I think that that's the question. You know, I was born in Korea. I have Korean parents. I have Korean, you know, I have a whole history. But what is it? What does that make me Korean? And the answer is yes, I suppose. You know, but I also think like I feel sometimes very distant to what that means too. You know, and I, you know, when Yang is like recognizing that he doesn't have real memories of. China or tea, and he has a longing for that sense of space. And I know when we even designed his memory experience, I, I wanted it to feel organic, almost as if his memories were creating its own feeling of space because he longed for it so much. And um, But yeah, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if, uh, I, I would say, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> do you have, what, what do you think? Well, no, just one thing I was thinking about that is that from the conspiracy theorist guy, yeah, yeah. that looked like Lenin to me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he was convinced that obviously there's, you know, yeah, the, so foreign, clearly yeah. because it's from China, it has yeah. something in there, right? So it's, it's yeah. all about the projections of who is who is looking at it. It's the in the yeah. eyes of whoever's observing it, um, what yeah. makes him Chinese. Yeah, and I think the question is the difference between being and yeah, if he's made in China, uh, China, you know, there's something about you can say as a product he's made in China. But if you're asking a question of like, does it make him, is his, you know, being, ch you know, Chinese, you know, but yeah, is he, he's a product of China, I would say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, by that logic, our iPhones yeah, are yeah, Chinese, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, right, right. Um, I think that might be it. I actually am trying you. to like figure out who's going to give me signal, but, I, but I'm going to call it at, yeah, yeah. since it's 10.15. But, but thank you so Thank much. you, guys. And I, I just wanted to thank Sloan. They've been so supportive of our film, and, they, and so thank you so much. So, so.